So this is uh, work with my fantastic graduate student, uh, Orjan Mugan, who's also here in the audience. Uh, she's been very insightful and productive through the, through the course of this work and, and has been a great collaborator. Uh, this is a spectrum of behavioral control that many of you will be familiar with from uh, on the left, uh, something we could call reactive mode, which is uh, you could think of as simple and uh, rapid transformations of sensory input to motor output. And so, for example, driving at night and you see a, a deer, you don't have a whole lot of things you can uh, plan over uh, or deliberate over. So you do uh, a simple motoric response of swerving. And at the other end of the spectrum, we have deliberative mode or um, also called planning or model-based uh, uh, thinking where uh, here we have an animal, a leopard, hunting an impala and making uh, use of um, obstacles in the environment and, and planning trajectories to avoid being disclosed by its target. So one thing you'll notice about these two scenarios is that in the, re the reactive mode is dependent upon a short visual sensory range. And deliberative mode has some relationship to longer visual sensory range. And it's a remarkable fact of our evolutionary history in the switch between life on land or life in water to life on land in the Devonian 380 million years ago that this same difference in sensory range pops up. And let me show you some data in support of that claim. So this is uh, just look at this bottom row for now. Uh, orbit size here, 15 millimeters. The range through water at coastal water turbidity is similar to what um, ancestral vertebrates that transitioned to land uh, lived in, uh, gave four meters of range for a 10 centimeter black disc in full daylight. Whereas through air with a small tweak in the corneal shape, you can get two orders of magnitude longer range. So attenuation length of light in water is order meters attenuation length of light in air is order of 100 kilometers. So that's the essence of this pattern. Something else you'll see is that as we increase orbit size, as we increase eye size, orbit size being a very solid proxy of eye size, uh, you'll see that the visual range through water is basically stable, doesn't change, but the visual range through air essentially doubles as we double orbit size. So when we first did these calculations uh, 10 years ago, I thought that this must mean that uh, when we transitioned in onto land, there must have been a change in orbit size. So during a sabbatical about five years ago, I found a paleontologist who was game to look at this problem with me. And we found essentially that that was correct, that uh, here is the uh, stem um, ancestral fish with their typical orbit sizes shown here with dots. Uh, relative to body size and so normalized by body size, transitional zone, and then big eyes up in the uh, fully terrestrial animals that followed, uh, Pederpes being the first fully terrestrialized form. But what was interesting was we discovered that actually the pop-up in size occurred in animals like Tiktaalik, which is a taxon known to paleontologists as being primarily aquatic. And it's known because it didn't have a full rib cage and some other features of the animal. Uh, and this was uh, a bit depressing initially, but uh, then had a silver lining in that uh, upon further analysis, you can see that eyes transition be to, from being on the side of the skull, laterally positioned, to being on top of the skull. And all these taxa, I'm only showing Tiktaalik, but all these taxa look like this, where the skull is essentially flattened and the, and the orbits are up on raised bony ridges to look out over the skull table. Why were they doing that? Well, it, it appears uh, from a variety of forms of evidence I, I don't have time to get into that they were hunting like crocodiles. And there were no vertebrates on land at this point, so what were they hunting? Well, 50 million years before vertebrates came onto land, invertebrates came onto land. And so there was this bounty of invertebrate food that these guys could spy and then would make short scrambles up onto land to capture. So perhaps there's a causal relationship, therefore between aerial vision over the water surface and terrestriality 380 million years ago. And the purpose of this talk today is to answer the question, did aerial vision also lead vertebrates to evolve planning? So here's uh, a cartoon to sort of give you an intuition pump for that idea that sort of 
uh, a replay of what we did with the, um, the driving in the dark versus uh, leopard hunting the impala. So here we are looking at a typical visual scene underwater. And typically what we have is an animal like a prey with a small um, movement, immediate motor volume where they're going to move in space over the next second or so. And their visual sensing area is not much larger than that. And they go around and then they detect a predator. And all uh, vertebrates up to amphibians have specialized command cells called modular cells, which give them very rapid escape reflexes. And so you do that. Now, uh, in a typical uh, land scene shown here, you have this two order of magnitude increase in the sensory bubble. The motor volume is roughly the same. Now, if the animal has a capability, it could conceive of a trajectory through space that would not be wise, one that would also probably not be wise because it caused a lot of splashing, and then one that would um, possibly get it to the safety zone without death. <coughs> So hopefully it picks that one, right? So um, while the reactive scenario in water is well supported by empirical data, this scenario is not so well supported. So let, let's see if we can actually gain some insight into this. Um, now the problem is, how do we really refine this idea to make specific testable claims? There's no way to observe the emergence or elaboration of planning circuits with terrestriality 380 million years ago, because that wasn't fossilized. So we're going to do a series of computational experiments. And what we're going to focus on is predator-prey interactions, because these are a dominant driver of evolution, particularly up to the time, 50 million years after animals made landfall, when the first vegetarians emerged, when the first capability to eat vegetation emerged. But before that, everything was basically either filter feeder or carnivore. So we're going to do predator-prey. And we're going to look at uh, a, a prey that plans, so only the prey plans, pursued by a predator that does not plan, while we control sensory range, the amount of planning the prey is allowed to do, and environmental complexity. All right, so the first hypothesis is that in dynamic environments, and that's important, that approximate ancestral aquatic habitats where the amount of perceivable spatial structure is low, planning confers a selective advantage proportionate to visual sensory range. And since ancestry, ancestral visual range is on the order of one to two body lengths, if hypothesis one is correct, then the advantage of planning in aquatic habitats was negligible. So here's our setup. Uh, our, our simplified methods is we have an environment with no clutter or obstacles, and we vary visual range and how many steps ahead the prey can plan. So here's our what we call pseudo-aquatic simulation setup. Uh, the rules of this world, we have uh, the prey has a predetermined visual range of one to five cells ahead. The predator can observe the entire environment. The prey's aim is to get to the safety position. The prey and predator can move in all directions, north, east, south, and west. The predator is on average 1.5 times faster than the prey. And the predator cannot plan and instead aggressively pursues the prey with some randomness. Finally, the prey has a predetermined number of states, meaning prey and predator locations, that it can forward simulate. Hereafter, we refer to this as planning acuity. So what is planning acuity? Well, we're using uh, POM, the POM-CP algorithm by Silver, and uh, here's an example of planning acuity 10 that was grown uh, by the algorithm where we have uh, some nodes from the start state expanded, some not. Uh, for a total of 10 states, and with 100 states, it looks like this. We tested in all the data that we'll be showing you subsequently, uh, planning acuity 1, 10, 100, 1,000, and 5,000. So here is prey behavior in pseudo-aquatic environments with visual range 1. This is a representative trial taken from a data set where we generate 20 random predator locations for each visual range. So what happens is the prey cannot see the predator from far away, so it often moves towards it and <laughs> suffers its demise. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, and the prey changes direction after it observes the predator, but the higher speed of the predator eventually leads to death. At visual range five, we see something different occasionally, um, not too often, but the prey can see the predator from far away, so it is able to change direction fast enough to avoid death. I say not often because the survival rate in these worlds is, is still pretty low. You'll see the data on that shortly. 
The wall following or thigmataxis observed in simulated prey across all visual ranges resembles behavior exhibited by rodents in open field tests of anxiety. So um, survival rate versus planning acuity and visual range is shown here. So we have planning acuity on the x-axis and survival rate in percent, meaning how often they get to the safety point on the y-axis. Visual range one, we get up to a meager 5% or 7% survival rate, but as we increase, there's an increase in survival rate with respect to planning acuity that is significantly higher as we go to higher visual ranges. So the two most important predictors of survival rate is observation distance which scales with visual range and is also correlated um, through the velocity of the animal to how temporally extended the space is, uh, and the number of times a predator is observed. So now uh, I'm going to show you what the incremental advantage of planning is across planning acuities at these different visual ranges. And what you see is that at low visual ranges, there's very little incremental advantage to increased planning. It's at the near one body length visual range of ancestral aquatic animals, there's almost no gain, but that goes up significantly uh, as we go to visual range five. But obviously, visual range is not the only important factor. Think of the leopard hunting the impala. There is clearly a role for spatial complexity there. And so how do we integrate that? So this is a second hypothesis. Planning becomes significantly more advantageous in a specific band of habitat complexity for animals with long sensory ranges acting in rapidly changing scenarios. So here, since the perceivable habitat complexity for aquatic life was outside of this band, as we'll show, if hypothesis two is correct, then planning was significantly less advantageous in the aquatic regime. So simplified methods here with prey, the prey that can view the entire environment now, except we're blocked by occlusions, we vary the environmental clutter quantified by entropy and we vary the planning acuity. The occlusions also obstruct the predator's line of sight, thus potentially hiding the prey. And the predator samples from a belief distribution centered around the prey's last known location during pursuit. So here's a, a few representative uh, trials taken from a data set where we generate 20 randomly generated worlds at each entropy level from 0.1 to 0.9. And for each of those, we, gener uh, we have 20 random worlds where we randomly spawn the predator in five different and originating locations. Quick yeah. Does the prey understand the visual available ranges of the predator? It knows that uh, as soon as it's out in the open, the predator can see it. Yes, if the but, predator. But can it? Does it know that the occlusions can block light? Yes. Away? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So at entropy point one, we see behaviors very similar to what uh, was present in the aquatic regime, which is wall following behaviors. At entropy level 0.5, something very different starts to happen. And just notice this area here, you're going to see the prey escape behind there and do something like a, almost like a broken wing display where you, where you try to lure a predator into a cul-de-sac and then escape. So watch what happens here. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> so we were quite impressed when this emerged from, from the uh, algorithms. Um, way to go, Palm CP. Uh, so the prey uses uh, the occlusion as a tool to hide and waits until its escape is certain. Now at entropy point seven, it's very interesting. If we go back to behaviors very similar to um, the, 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 the ones at low entropy, where we, but it's now because there's really only one path or two paths to get uh, to the safety. So we have, uh, again, highly stereotyped uh, behaviors. So now let's look at survival rate, planning acuity, and entropy. So on the x-axis, we have entropy level. On the y-axis, we have survival rate. And then the different colored lines are different levels of planning acuity. So similar to pseudo-aquatic environments, prey survival rate is limited in low entropy environments. Uh, the predator's speed and pursuit strategy restricts the prey's survival rate, res which results in marginal benefit from increased planning, and that's shown by the incremental benefit of planning here, plot. Uh, 
Uh, and, and really, the, the, uh, the stories disclosed by this action frequency heat map for success paths by the prey. So this is over all uh, trials, what the, what the most commonly taken paths are. And you can see that they're pretty focused on the, on the walls and they're pretty, they're pretty stereotyped. So planning cues, highly stereotypical wall following behaviors at high planning acuities. As entropy increases, survival rate also increases until mid-range entropy environments are reached. So now the incremental benefit goes up considerably. And uh, you can see in the heat map of success paths how the dispersion of the paths is a, is a nice proxy for the variability of behavior in these worlds. So this uh, low, this high, more dispersion of path success paths. So in planning no longer cues stereotypical action sequences, even in a fixed environment, the prey's predator avoidance behaviors are now highly variable. So survival rate decreases as entropy increases and increased clutter decreases the overall space in which the prey can move. At high entropy, it's very interesting, at high entropy uh, 0.9, even at 5,000 planning acuity, 5,000 steps ahead, the uh, strategy of planning only one step ahead, which is essentially random behavior, matches the behavior, the success rate at 5,000. So planning gives you no benefit, essentially. So we see a sharp decrease from performance at mid-range entropy if we look at the incremental benefit of planning. So now uh, a little bit more on the high entropy condition. The reduced state space causes there to be only a few routes to safety. And so now here's a heat map for one of the high entropy worlds. It's essentially just a corridor. Success becomes dependent on predator and environment initialization. And what we get is essentially simple behaviors and simple environments. So let me say how we say simple environments here, since we've only talked about low entropy and high entropy. We've just applied a commonly used uh, measure of network complexity to our grid worlds. Uh, and uh, those, uh, that measure of network complexity gives basically the same complexity level for the low entropy world as it does for the high entropy world, and it gives a much higher level of complexity for the mid-range entropy uh, condition. I'll be happy to talk more about that measure in the Q&A. Uh, so in simple low entropy environments, the prey strategy is to go towards regions that have limited access, which are walls. This single good strategy results in low spread of success strategy success strategies, success paths. So this is a spread of paths that led to success. It's low and it's fairly tightly distributed. The predator's strategy is just simply the reverse to go into the center uh, of, the, of, the, of the arena. And so this is the action frequency for the predator. And now uh, what we want though is, uh, let me go back a sec. What we want is really a measure therefore of how connected the cells of this space are. And so for that, what we've used is this measure called eigencentrality, many of you will be familiar with, which represents the weighted sum of direct connections as well as indirect connections uh, of every length. So it takes into account the entire pattern of the network. High eigencentrality corresponds to open spaces, low eigencentrality to narrow corridors and walls, and mid-range is some mixture of these two states, edge cases. So both the prey and predator strategies is dependent on the connectedness. So here we plot the eigenvector centrality for each cell. It peaks where the predator wants to go and, and, and is minimal where the prey wants to go. So now we can look at, in this open environment, what, what, what's the correlation between survival paths and eigencentrality? Not surprisingly, it's a good uh, correlation and it's negative. The prey wants to go where there's low centrality, eigencentrality. And again, it's stigma taxis that we see in the initial stages of an animal in a novel environment, at least rodents, this is very well characterized. So uh, there's a profusion of paths that is restricted uh, due to high clutter uh, in the high entropy condition, which is another simple world. Not the, not, the, not the open environment that's pseudo-aquatic. And similar to low entropy environments, the spread of success paths is low. And here, interestingly, 
The strategies are not based on environmental variables, but are highly dependent on predator initialization and the available escapes pa escape paths to safety. So if you plot now the eigencentrality of this world, you can see that the most frequently taken success path traverses both regions of low eigencentrality and regions of high eigencentrality where the animal is exposed to attack from the predator, because really there's no other option. So high entropy environments are jungle-like, decreasing the necess necessity to strategically plan with respect to occlusions. So now if we look at the correlation between survival paths and eigencentrality, rather than being uh, strongly negative, it's a little bit above zero, so it becomes decorrelated, largely decorrelated. So uh, let's shift to complex behaviors and complex environments. Now success is dependent on the prey's ability to rapidly update planned action sequences based on the predator's location. And it's um, written uh, a little bit in the sort of heat map of success trajectories being so dispersed. The spread of paths that led to success is now much broader than in the low entropy case. And what's interesting is that uh, if we look at the spatial autocorrelation of environment eigencentrality, what we see is that what happens in these worlds is that there's clusterings of regions of low eigencentrality and regions of high eigencentrality. And this forces the prey uh, to move between regions of high and low eigencentrality. And it appears that where planning becomes really necessary for survival is at these transition points which at high acuity results in complex behaviors such as the hiding case I showed you earlier. So the dis distribution of eigencentrality may explain the effect of environment topology on the expected utility and location of planning. And I just want to show this great data that uh, David, who's going to be David Reddish, collected um, quite some time ago now, ten, over 10 years ago, uh, where he showed forward sweeps at uh, key junctions, which, were, which are transitions. Here we plot uh, in color the, uh, the eigencentrality of this T maze that he was experimenting with. And at the junction, he found forward sweeps as the animal uh, did vicarious trial and error behavior right at that junction. So uh, we're now going to look at what is the margin of planning over a habit-based approach. And so uh, to get insight as to how, well, how amenable these different worlds are to a habit-based approach, we have to pick an algorithm. Uh, we've tried a few different ones. We like the probabilistic prey policy reuse uh, algorithm, PRQ learning by Fernandez et al. 2006. Um, so in habit-based action selection, the prey, instead of planning, chooses from a library of environment-specific success paths. Uh, after implementing the prescri prescribed action sequence, the prey weights that chosen action sequence based on the terminal reward, and the probability of choosing an action sequence from the library increases with its weight. All right, so first thing we looked at is uh, what is the distribution of weights on the different paths that were successful in the different environments? And as you might expect, at low entropy, the distribution of weights is very low. Similarly, at high entropy, low distribu distribution of weights. And as the algorithm tries to do its best in these much more complex environments, it results in a bigger spread of weights on the policy. So here we have, uh, I, I guess, a key plot for, for the study. So uh, in high and low entropy environments, the importance of planning is diminished, allowing for habit-based strategies to achieve comparable survival rates right here. And right here, there's no statistically significant difference between the success of planning and habit. But here, in the mid-range uh, complexity, in the high complexity mid-range entropy regime, planning takes a hit, or habit takes a hit, and planning does quite, quite a bit better. And so if we subtract, if we look at the difference in survival rate, planning minus habit, we see this very nice, uh, very focal signal for the utility of planning in mid-range or high-complexity environments. So now I've been talking about entropy uh, as a way to characterize the topology of, of these spaces and talking a bit about spatial complexity through our network measure. I want to relate this now to uh, com more commonly used measures for the structure of terrestrial and, and aquatic scenes. So fractal dimension is 
something many of you will know of. So we, we look, fractal dimension characterizes the pattern complexity as a ratio of change in detail with respect to a change in scale. Other researchers have found that natural terrestrial scenes fall in this green band of fractal dimensions around 1 to 1.6. Um, and we uh, have done a bunch of characterization of natural aquatic scene uh, fractal dimension for clear waters and turbid waters, and we find the band is right here. So now what we can do is look at the, the view, the, the sort of top view and the prey view after we do some uncreative topiary and, and turn these block worlds into square bushes, essentially, <laughs> uh, and, and look at what kind of scene uh, the prey would, 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 would see from, from, from the ground. Turns out that, uh, right, uh, uh, and plot, sorry, uh, we'll plot now, what the fractal dimension of each of, our, uh, of each of our cluster of worlds at different entropy levels, how that falls in terms of fractal dimension. And the ones, I should mention that peak in human navigation ability in terrestrial habitats through studies in VR has been found to be around 1.3. And that's very close to the region of high complexity, high spatial complexity where we find planning is uh, maximally effective. So if we bunch, if we group the data now by terrestrial, whether it's in terrestrial or aquatic fractal dimensions, we can see that uh, the incremental benefit of planning is considerably higher in terrestrial uh, fractal dimension uh, zone than in the aquatic fractal dimension zone. And similar survival rate of planning minus habit quite a bit higher for terrestrial versus aquatic. Aquatic's way down close to zero. So summary, uh, hypothesis one, in dynamic environments that approximate ancestral aquatic habitats where the perceivable spatial structure is, structure is low, planning confers a selective advantage proportionate to visual sensory range. We found that the selective advantage of planning increases with range and is very low at aquatic ancestral sensory ranges of one to two body lengths. Hypothesis two is that planning becomes significantly more advantageous in a specific band of habitat complexity perceivable at low, long range. And we found that planning is far superior to habit at the perceivable high spatial complexity typical of terrestrial environments. At low complexity typical of aquatic, Habitats, habit does just as well as the highest levels of planning we've tested. So let me uh, give you one possible evolutionary scenario then. Uh, we start off with this animal, Tiktaalik, 385 million years ago, fueled by the aerial visual stimulus of undefended invertebrates. Uh, many vertebrates begin to acquire big eyes and other adaptations such as anti-desiccation uh, mechanisms to better cope with excursions onto land. Eventually, the allure of the undefended food eventuates in full terrestriality around the time of the taxon uh, called Pederpes, 355 million years ago, which is 30 million years after Tiktaalik. Step three, the computational load of planning is quite high, as many of you know, you've, many of you have done work on this um, it's exponential with the number of steps ahead. So in our trivial grid world scenario, even just 10 steps ahead gives you 10,000 states to have to compute uh, in the worst case, in the worst case. So here I've highlighted uh, on this evolutionary brain tree, the uh, land animals. Clearly, uh, we don't have a lot of data on planning and reptiles. The theory would suggest that they do better than fish. Uh, but it is clear that mammals uh, do it, and it's, the behavioral evidence is quite strong that certain birds do it. So habit, um, habit, the computational complexity of habit algorithms is much lower, possibly constant time after they've been made. Uh, so perhaps planning pushed for bigger brains. But there's, some, there's a wrinkle going on here, right? That, uh, so amniotes split 30 million years after terrestriality, and we've got birds and mammals that are quite a bit ahead. Why is that? Well, one possible reason might be that they came up with endothermy. And so if you look at this, these uh, line up 
brain mass versus body mass logarithmic log log plot, the, endother the endotherms of birds and the mammals, at one kilogram body mass, they have an order of magnitude larger brain mass uh, over uh, ectotherms. And so, you know, reptiles didn't get ecto endothermy. Um, maybe that's a computational break on their planning ability. We don't actually know what their planning ability is, so maybe, maybe that's not true, but perhaps uh, endothermy was needed to deal with this massive demand of, of computational complexity for planning. So uh, we presented a framework for assessing the adaptive significance of a hallmark of intelligence rooted in evolutionary biology. We have a possible guide for identifying where to focus biological efforts. I'm really happy to have recently received a brain initiative proposal in collaboration with Dan Dombeck, where we're gonna examine interactions between the hippocampus and striatum as we smoothly vary complexity in a dynamic world uh, with a ethologically relevant context in combination with his two photon VR worlds that are titrated similarly. So uh, I'm gonna close with a few thoughts. Um, one is uh, long range vision and complex habitats favored the evolution of neural circuits for planning, I propose. Our ability to plan is constrained uh, perhaps by what was adaptive for the size and complexity of our ancestral environment. I think there might be an interesting case to discuss here that given pressing but distant really not quite so distant existential threats to our species, such as climate change, is, is, now, is it now a moral imperative for neuroscientists to understand the temporal and spatial constraints of planning towards something like a neuroscience of sustainability? So um, I'm going to leave you with uh, this quote, and I'm happy to take any questions. Pursuing it, yes. It has memory. Yeah. Well, uh, how would you characterize it, Oregon? It's more like. Well, it knows, it knows uh, once it has stage information, it knows its own location and a predator location. So once it turns away, uh, because it maintains a belief state it's, about it, predator right. location, yeah. it knows a very uh, tight distribution. Area. Yeah, it's it diffusing is, over time, but it's yeah. initially quite tight. So, um, but you mentioned a big thing about terrestrial and aquatic, and there are quite complex aquatic uh, environments, coral reefs, which are, yes. to my knowledge, not that recent. Yeah. And so, there are, so and, and there are also animals that have never been to death, terrestrial, like uh, cephalopods, for instance, um, right. that do some kind of have been shown to do so. So, what about the yeah? Okay. So. Addition to the terrestrial story in the aquatic. So, so the, the whole issue of what goes on with coral reefs is a really interesting one. So visual range is still very short in coral reefs, uh, but people who have looked at uh, uh, the brains of fish specialized for coral reefs, like Dembski, has shown that the, the uh, teleost homologue, this is in squirrel fish, the teleost homologue of the hippocampus is hypertrophied in that animal. So, uh, so, so there's, there's better planning probably amongst those animals uh, than, than your typical pelagic animal, which was sort of my model for the pseudo-aquatic, which is you look in all directions and it's blurry. Now, but keep in mind, again, visual range in coral reef areas is still as pathetic as I showed uh, there. So, so it's tightly constrained. It's just that you, because you're up close to some spatial complexity, it is possible you would need to do some planning. Uh, so I don't rule that out. Now with cephalopods, it's complicated. They're hunted by uh, the most intelligent vertebrates, both birds and uh, dolphins and whales that have these massive brains are hunting cephalopods, are undefended by any armor. And they seem to have adapted uh, a regime where they've gone into behavioral complexity as a defense mechanism. Uh, saying that though, um, and they also have exquisite eyes, uh, but saying that um, uh, how much cephalopods can do uh, 
is is really undocumented as yet. Like there's, I've talked to a bunch of them, and they've said that whole thing about they watch one person unscrew a jar and then they go do it. They do it once and they never can repeat it. Is is what I've heard. So how how much that is true versus fable, we need to find out. Uh, it's clear that they're up to something pretty interesting, but how they got there, it might be quite different from what the vertebrate line did.